Good evening and welcome. I know there are a few people still drifting up from a wonderful sing-in on Sproul Plaza, so there may be more people drifting in, but um, I think I've been told that we should get started. It's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all on behalf of the College of Letters and Sciences to this year's On the Same Page program dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement. The key organizer of this program was my colleague uh, in the college, Dean Steve Martin, who is the Dean of Biological Sciences, and he will be hosting the rest of this evening. So I'd like to welcome Steve to the podium, and uh, I hope you enjoy this evening's program. Thank you, Carla. Uh, I wanted to start out by saying that choosing a book uh, and a keynote speaker for this year's On the Same Page program was absolutely the most fun thing uh, I've done as dean this past year. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge my partners in crime, um, Kim Voss, Mark Peterson, uh, Rob Kaufman, uh, Chris Kutz, uh, and Elizabeth Abel. We all uh, formed a group and we, we, um, we came to a very rapid consensus. I also want to acknowledge the hard work of Alex Schwartz sitting down there, who's our academic planning coordinator, uh, without whom this program and this lecture would not have been possible. And finally, I want to thank um, the free speech veterans who've come here this evening and who've come to the campus over the summer uh, to introduce a new generation of students to student protest and, and social activism. So before I introduce today's speaker, Robbie, Co Robbie Cohen, I just want to say a few words about the On the Same Page program. The goal of this program is to introduce new students uh, to something that they can share in common, to give them a sort of intellectual welcome to the campus, something that they can talk about together and with the faculty. It was created in 2006 by the College of Letters and Science, uh, but it's now spread to the rest of the campus and is sponsored by all of the colleges on the campus that admit undergraduates. So it's, we hope it's a program that will appeal to undergraduates no matter uh, through which college they've been admitted to Cal. And in the past, the themes have ranged from the origins of the universe to the films of Ang Lee and our genetic makeup. They've really uh, ranged very widely. Uh, but this year being the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement, um, it was really a very clear and a very easy choice uh, to center the program uh, on the free speech movement and uh, its aftermath and its consequences. So um, we chose to, to, uh, to focus on uh, the free speech movement and on social protest and on student activism some of the events that are being planned are on these little flyers that are outside on the tables. Um, I don't want to go through all of the events in detail, but I just want to shout out a few of them. There are going to be three panels in October, one on October the 8th on voter suppression, one on October the 13th on inequality, and one on music and protest on October the 30th with a concert by Mavis Staples uh, that same evening on October the 30th. Okay, so let me turn now to tonight's speaker, uh, Robbie Cohen. To anchor this year's program, we chose uh, and gave to every incoming student and every faculty member a copy of uh, Robbie's book, Freedom's Orator, which is also, I think, you will see outside on one of the tables. Freedom's Orator, Mario Savio and the Radical Leg Legacy of the 1960s. So Freedom's Orator is a fascinating account of the life of Mario Savio and his leadership during the free speech movement. It recounts his origins as a working class Italian American, how he overcame a severe stutter to become a powerful orator. Uh, it describes his um, involvement and his, uh, his awakening if I can put in those terms, in the civil rights movement during Freedom Summer in, in Mississippi. And it describes in detail his leadership and his political savvy and his intellectual integrity during the free speech movement itself. And then it goes on and ends by describing 
his career after the free speech movement and his lifelong commitment uh, to social justice. So it's a real pleasure to introduce the author of Freedom's Orator and tonight's speaker, Robbie Cohen. Um, Robbie is a professor of history and social studies at uh, NYU, New York University. His work and scholarship focus on social protest and social movements in the United States, uh, beginning actually, I think, from his time here at Cal as a, as a graduate student. In addition to Freedom's Orator, he's published a number of books on the free speech movement, including a collection of Mario Savio's uh, most important speeches and writings. He's also been interested in the African-American struggle and African-American history. He's written a number of uh, books on that topic and on student activism and desegregation in the South. Uh, he served as a consultant for a number of historical films. Uh, many of you may have seen the documentary 1964 uh, on the PBS American Experience series. He was a consultant uh, for that um, fascinating documentary. So tonight, Robbie is gonna talk to us about Mario Savio and his generation, uh, and he's also gonna talk about the impact of students and protest movements on social change uh, and on social justice. And his talk is entitled, Can Students Change the World? Well, there it says, yes, they can. The title I have is Mario, Savi, Mario Savio and the Radical Legacy of the 1960s. So please w join me in welcoming Robbie uh, to give this evening's talk. Um, thank you. Thank everybody for coming. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dean, Martin, Dean Steve Martin and the faculty committee on the On the Same Page program. Uh, Jeannie Adams, Paul Sokow, and uh, Alex Schwartz, uh, who's done just great work in helping. Uh, I've been going to lots of other classes and talking about the book. It's, it's, a, it's really been a pleasure connecting with a lot of the faculty and students here. Um, it's also been great to be back in Berkeley. Uh, but before I go on, I just wanted to say I saw that Jack Weinberg is here and Lynn Hollander Savia. I just like all the free speech movement veterans uh, to stand up for a second. Uh, and I want to just uh, acknowledge them and thank them for for what they did to, thank you. Um, because if, I, if they weren't here, if they hadn't done what they'd done, I wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here, and we probably, we might not have a free speech here. So um, thank you very much for being here. Um, when you're away from Berkeley, as long as I have, you forget how bright the students are, how politically aware, and how, how high energy. It's been really a pleasure to, uh, to be uh, uh, teaching a course, two courses in the history department, and I want to thank the history department for making that possible. Um, the topic tonight, can students change the world, um, I gave away the answer already, I'm sorry, um, is a huge one, and, we, and we'll have time to only do a small slice of it, uh, uh, mostly from the 60s, but, uh, but I did want to at least mention at the beginning that students changed America in major ways, both during and before the 60s. If, if you're a student and have a work, have a work study job, you uh, can thank the student activists of the 1930s, um, who I wrote my first book about when they all left was young, which started as a dissertation here, um, because they put that, they seeded that idea uh, and, and put pressure on the New Deal to, to create that program, and that was where the idea of federal uh, work study dollars and programs came from. Uh, college students were some of the shock troops for the uh, women's suffrage movement. So uh, it gave, helped women get the right to vote. Uh, student activists turns litigants played important roles in the, uh, at least particularly in the Virginia and South Carolina cases that went into the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision and court cases in the 1950s. Um, also every higher education's desegregation case from the 30s from Murray and Gaines all the way up to Sweat versus Painter uh, and beyond, those were all done, you know, the litigants were students. So student activism isn't always with a picket sign. Sometimes it goes on, uh, into, it's gone on into a courtroom as well. Uh, that today's youths are not subject to a military draft, can vote at 18, that college students are not required at state universities to take ROTC, which was mandatory at many schools in the 1920s and 30s, uh, that they're not subject to curfews, and regimentation in their campus social lives is all because of the activism of students. 
Um, my favorite pre-60s activism at Berkeley uh, is a program called the Fair Bear Program. And that, you know, the bear is the symbol of the school. In the 30s was a very hard times, and uh, um, students were being exploited by local employers. They'd be paid below minimum wage, uh, anybody's concept of minimum wage, and, uh, and also if they worked in restaurants, they're supposed to bring their own uniforms and, and, and launder them themselves. And uh, the student government, uh, the HUC, back then had a labor committee and a welfare co student welfare committee, and they did an investigation of these conditions, and they set up a program uh, called the Fair Bear Program that if an employer was unfair to student workers, they would get on a boycott list and students would be asked not to patronize them. If they did uh, adhere to these minimum wage and, and working conditions requirement, they, they'd, be, uh, they'd get a Fair Bear sticker and students would, and they put them on, the, on their, their window and door and students would patronize that. So that's, these are just, and when I say change the world, I'm talking about making even a, a, a small change that can help people's lives. And Mario Savi used to refer to that as, some people advocate that as consequential speech. You know, just talking about world revolution, you know, that's rarely going to be a problem. But talking about, we're going to go downtown to picket to get rid of uh, segregation, or we're going to uh, demand fair hiring, uh, or unionize these workers, that a lot of times is, is, is much more controversial. So um, I think in all these ways, it's obvious that students have helped to change the world. But before going further on this topic uh, and the Berkeley context, I want to turn to the issue of historical memory and commemoration, given that we're commemorating the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement. The fact that the University of California is sponsoring a, a range of 50, uh, FSM 50 programs, as you heard from Dean Martin, in, including the selection of, of Mario Salvio's biography, is quite significant and is a dramatic departure from uh, the first few decades after the free speech movement. Uh, in fact, in December of 1965, uh, this is FSM 50, that was FSM 1, a group of FSM veterans uh, put together, uh, they were gonna do a comical play uh, written by Barbara Gar, uh, not play, a puppet show with a huge Mario Savio and Clark Kerr uh, with these uh, San Francisco Mime Troop uh, um, uh, heads and everything, and uh, it's a very funny, uh, a funny puppet show. And by the way, the script of it is coming out in a book that the uh, Daily Californian. Uh, I work with them. They're putting together a book uh, for on FSM 50 on the uh, the reprints of the FS, the FSM's coverage by the Daily Californian, and uh, and memoirs by FSM veterans. And um, they have are, are reprinting the script the script from the puppet show, which is very funny. But when they tried to put on this puppet show, one of the deans said, "Why would you want to commemorate the free speech movement? That's like commemorating a presidential assassination." So um, now, by the time I got here as a graduate student, in the, in the, and the 20th anniversary came up in the 1980s, things had not really changed all that much. A group of FSM veterans and, fa and, and a, few group, a few faculty and graduate students put together a, a very successful commemoration uh, on, on Sproul Plaza, lots of, of, of panels, and Mario Salvio's first speech on campus in more than a decade. It drew a huge crowd, and I think the whole, uh, the whole uh, commemoration was very successful, but the administration had just really nothing to do with it. Uh, back then, the FSM, I think, was seen as a part of Cal's past, that the administration wished had never occurred, didn't want to be reminded about, and certainly didn't want to commemorate. And so that was 84. In 1989, uh, the art historian Peter Sells and a group of faculty organized to have this art competition to have an art installation to, art, to honor the free speech movement. And uh, uh, back then, uh, and they raised a good deal of money to do it, and back then Chancellor uh, Heyman uh, uh, objected. He said you could honor free speech, but not the free speech movement, because it, it, was, it was too divisive. It wasn't really until following Mario Salvio's passing in 1996 that things began to change, that you had the, uh, the, the uh, honoring of Mario's memory with the Mario Salvio steps uh, Sproul, from Sproul, from where he used to give his speeches. And uh, um, I think that what really had to happen in order for things to change dramatically was a new generation of administrators uh, had to come into, uh, into uh, office. The, some of the administrators, I think, uh, of Heyman's generation uh, tended to blame the free speech movement for everything they didn't like about the 60s, the polarization, the political violence of the late 60s. And so it was very, uh, it was really just, that it wasn't until that generation left the scene that you got uh, a change. And I think that the, the next generation of administrators um, after Heyman began to see that if you think about it, over 700 FSM uh, of students getting arrested, thousands of more feeling sympathetic and 
supportive and proud that they had expanded free speech on campus, that it was, it was, it was a way of like, you know, if you ignore that history, you're kind of ignoring a lot of your, your family, your alums, your, the people who've gone here. And I think the administration began to be more cognizant of that, and particularly when um, uh, Steve Silberstein, uh, a software pioneer who helped to, uh, to digitize libraries, um, made a generous donation to the library, uh, endowed the library and uh, um, an FSM cafe here. And I think that began to demonstrate that, you know, that this is part of the legacy of the FSM and that you know, it, it is also, I think, it does give critics of the FSM and the, the 60s left a kind of a big problem. Uh, they have been arguing for years that the, that the new left damaged the university. And here's a, a, a real case where you know, the, the new left's legacy literally enriched the university. So I think that, I bring this all up because I think that, just so I, I hope that we can all appreciate what's going on here, that, uh, that the university is, is coming to grips with its, its history, it's facing its history and it's honoring uh, those who sacrificed to expand freedom here. And I think that's, that's worth, um, worth, worth considering. Um, the FSM's legacy, I would say, is obviously no museum piece. Um, the movement's legacy and impact on the university endures and, and its implications for free speech today is still in, 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 is a matter of some controversy. Um, though long familiar with the debates about that legacy and about free speech, even I have been kind of surprised in my first weeks back here at Berkeley at the intensity of the debate about Chancellor Dirk's comments about civility. Um, there was a, um, uh, a statement that he made connecting to FSM 50, which he talked about the need to be civil and respectful in campus speech. And some critics tried, tried to connect that to a Midwestern academic freedom case uh, where civility had been used to prevent the appointment of, of a professor at the University of Illinois who had been critical uh, in what was considered an uncivil way of, uh, of uh, uh, Israeli policy in Gaza. Uh, and so I, the, the number of emails and articles and messages I've got on this are, have been really uh, amazing, and it does show to me that people still care a lot about these free speech issues, which I'll say more about in a moment. But also, as I was walking through Sather Gate the other day, I was handed the Campus Humor magazine, which used to be the Pelican, but it's now called the, the Heuristic Squelch. And um, they have composed a fictional message from Chancellor Dirks, which I wanted to share with you in, in part. It says, this fall marks the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement. Uh, free speech is the cornerstone of our nation, which is why our free speech movement cafe is such an ideal choice for your pick of succulent sandwiches and, de and dessert squares. <laughs> as we remember the protest, uh, protesters from that iconic but thankfully distant time, it's important to remember that the four pillars of free speech, civility, docility, espresso brownies, and compliance. <laughs> so be careful to keep in mind that when issues are inherently divisive, controversial, and capable of rousing strong feelings, it's best not to speak publicly about such things. Somebody's feelings might get hurt, and we wouldn't want that now, would we? Sure, you may get, hurt, you may, you get angry, you may feel intensely compassionate towards the plight of your fellow citizens. Um, however, this is no reason to raise your voice. Uh, remember, people are trying to study. If, if, you, if you want to discuss an issue with someone, you, you don't have to shout at them with a the loudspeaker. You just have to converse quietly while you wait in line for coffee. This, this is the best way for us to speak politely and move forward towards an open democratic society. Needless to say, the fact that the chancellor can be lampooned and criticized this way does attest that free speech is alive and well at the University of California. <laughs> My own perspective on this controversy is linked, uh, is, is probably different than most people. It's linked to my own uh, 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 work on pre-60s uh, uh, Berkeley history. And the fact that there's so much concern about public discourse and free speech on campus is really something relatively new at Berkeley in terms of its overall history. In the 1930s and early 40s, this was not the case. Uh, speakers were banned left and right. Um, Harry Bridges, for example, the West Coast uh, radical labor leader, was banned three times within a three-year period. And in the letter from the dean who did the banning to President Sproul, he explained to an approving President Sproul that the first time he banned Bridges, it was because he was under deportation proceedings. The second time, it was because he was convinced that he wouldn't present an a unbiased point of view on labor issues. <laughs> <laughs> And the third was um, that he thought it would bring criticism on the university if he came here. And really the only ones who protested about that were a few student activists and really Bridges were not, not allowed to speak. 
So, you know, relative to that time, the fact that there's so much concern about free speech, I think, is a healthy thing. And I'd say this, by the way, wasn't something just in 1940 or 30s. Henry Mayer, a historian, uh, was a graduate student here. He'd just come from Chapel Hill in the early, in 61. And he, in Chapel Hill, had brought, um, he'd heard that Malcolm X had been uh, barred from speaking in, in the nearby Durham, North Carolina. And so he was a student involved in the Carolina Forum and had Malcolm X speak there and uh, at the university, and there was no problem. He came here and he found out that Malcolm X had been barred from speaking in, in March of 61. And so, uh, and also, back then, the, the regulations on the student government said the student government was not allowed to take positions on off-campus issues. So if he if he try if someone if he tried to do here what he did in North Carolina say that he was upset about Malcolm X being banned in Durham that would have not been allowed. So so my point is that um, that the sort of health of free speech on this campus is is quite good. My impression is in terms of this controversy that the previous administration's mishandling of the Occupy protest in 2011, especially especially the initial defense of the uh, uh, police use, use of force to uh, disperse the Occupy protesters um, left a kind of lingering cloud of distrust with the administration, and that's really kind of colored this, this controversy. That, um, uh, you know, maybe other people, aside from the chancellor, could raise these issues and we could have a discussion, but it seems like people are unwilling to have that discussion uh, with, with, with an administrator, given this sort of political baggage from what had happened earlier. At least that's my reading of it. But I'd like to briefly explore some of these, uh, sp these sp speech issues via someone who maybe has the moral authority uh, uh, to, to discuss them, and that's Mario Savio, uh, the leader of the free speech movement. Savio did not use the word civility when he discussed speech issues on campus. He did, however, reflect on the mode of political discourse that was newly possible here in the wake of the free speech movement. Within 24 hours of the free speech movement's victory on December 8th, 64, when the academic senate voted that the university would no longer regulate the content of speech, Mario gave a, a, a victory speech on December 9th, and where he said this, we're asking that there be no, no restrictions on the content of speech, save those provided by the courts. And that's an enormous amount of freedom. Uh, and people can say things within that area of freedom which are not responsible. Now we finally got into a position where we have to consider being responsible because now we have the freedom within which to be responsible. And I'd like to say at this time, I'm confident that the students and faculty at the University of California will exercise their freedom with the same responsibility they've shown in winning their freedom. So it's an interesting combination of freedom and responsibility. You know, the idea, he didn't use the word civility, but he talked about responsibility. And in raising the ideal of responsibility, Savio was inviting Berkeley students and faculty to consider their approach to public speech on campus. Savio was not setting out rules or regulations, and in fact, he and the FSM had just spent the semester trying to get rid of the regulation of the content of speech and just won on that. So the guide here with, for the activists that he was talking to was their own consciences. Mario did express confidence that they'd exercise their new freedom uh, uh, responsibly, as I just read, Still, it's evident to me that he raised this issue of responsibility intentionally. He wanted the campus community to think about it. And this isn't the only time this kind of coupling of freedom and responsibility came up. It also came up uh, in 1989 in that free speech uh, art competition I mentioned to you, that you know, the one that got sort of censored by the chancellor and couldn't talk about free speech movement, but you could talk about free speech. Well, Mario drafted but never sent in a, a really interesting design for a, a free speech movement monument at, 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 at Berkeley. And I think it's really interesting. It speaks to a lot of these issues. I just wanted to share it with you before I get back to our topic here today. Um, his uh, FSM monument would have uh, directly addressed the, um, well, it was centered on those signs. You know, when you walk onto campus, right where the free speech area was, it says uh, uh, property of the Board of Re these little plaques, Property of the Board of Regents, permission to pass revocable at any time. Remember that? Have you seen those? Well, Salvia's monument plan would have replaced the central plaque with a larger one bearing no inscription whatsoever. And he wanted to bring those plaques all around the campus to the free speech area on, on Sproul Steps as a sort of symbol of the fact that the, the Regents' regulation of the content of speech was over, okay? So that's a beautiful sort of image of freedom. He also led up to this free speech area and to this steel, this, this sculpture, 
which would uh, have on it uh, uh, Diogenes, Mario's favorite free speech quote, quote, the most beautiful thing in the world is the freedom of speech. And, and that will be translated into all the major languages of the world. But the other part of it, which speaks to this uh, controversy, and you know, Mario, um, I should say, like, I had read this proposal many times before, and it just struck me, there's always like an extra gear there. He says something that, you know, it's a little frustrating that you're writing about somebody who's smarter than you. You know, he senses things that you don't know. And I think this is one of those times, because I thought it was sort of strange, but as I'm reflecting on it, it has sort of deep relevance to what we're talking about today. Along with these tributes to freedom, Mario wanted to place on the FSM monument an aphibic oath, which is modeled on that of ancient Athens. Mario loved uh, classical studies. It was uh, something that liberated him from, uh, he was breaking with the Catholic Church. And this was like a pre, for him it was, a, uh, ancient Greece was like a pre-Christian counterculture. Uh, anyway, so um, he said, this is the aphibic oath he wanted on the, on the monument. We will never intentionally bring disgrace upon this our university. By our words and actions, we endeavor to honor the ideals of those who came before us and deepen and strengthen this community in which we are privileged to speak. It's a very interesting. Uh, for Savio, the key point of these words on the monument was to prod speakers and listeners to remember their responsibility, to think critically. According to Savio, and these are his words, just as the oath reminds the speaker of the speaker's special responsibility, so too these words of Diogenes are intended to remind the members of the audience that free speech deserves the highest respect. Both statements are intentionally ambiguous as well. For the oath is subscribed to inwardly, if at all, and the speaker is free to judge whether he has spoken worthily. Uh, similarly, the responsibility of the audience extends in the spirit of Diogenes to judging critically whether the speech he hears, it hears is, is really free or is merely cant, that is merely rhetoric or, or dogma. Though Savia's FSM monument was never built, I think we honor it and the FSM by considering the questions it raises about the relationship between thought and speech, freedom and responsibility. Savia was inviting us to think about what it means to speak persuasively, listen critically, and to speak and act in ways that strengthen our community. So I think, I think this is something you know, that relates to, again, not issuing regulations, but talking about the, the nature of, of political discourse on campus. And I thought about, you know, I've done work on desegregation. The University of Georgia in 1961 had a very ugly segregationist riot sparked by a demonstration with a, behind a banner, nigger go home. And you know, when I, rereading those words, it occurred to me that that's sort of what he's talking about. When he, when that, that phrase about, um, you know, that you, uh, to bring disgrace upon our university, it took decades for the University of Georgia to live that down. And so, you know, there is a kind of historical uh, weight to what he said there, which I thought, I think is worth considering. Okay, I'd like to go back to the main topic here tonight, which is the question raised in my talk about uh, whether students can change the world. Obviously they can, and Mario believed that before, during, and after the free speech movement. Before he ever uh, entered Cal, he had been involved in activism of, of, of different sort, not with protest signs, but doing work, anti-poverty work in Mexico. Uh, they built a laundry facility. This is the summer of 63 when he's still a Queens College student, a little bit like a private uh, Peace Corps of the Catholic uh, student group there to, do, to build a, library, uh, a laundry facility for the poor and a, and a school. And while he was down there, he realized he was not only helping those poor people in central Mexico, but himself. That it began to, the, the extreme poverty he saw, there was like nothing he'd ever seen before. And it led him to question the church, the political and social structure. And also, he began to understand about resentment of American expansionism. That in his high school, he'd never learned much about, um, about US, Mexican, American war. And was really surprised that what to him it seemed ancient history was what he, what he realized was, quote, a galling bone of resentment sticking in the throat of these people that wait, that used to be Mexico over there. And so at that point, it was actually, I started to wonder what the legitimacy of that border was between the United States and Mexico. So before the FSM, Mario was thinking this way, and after the FSM as well, that when he came back for the 20th anniversary, um, he spoke about uh, Reagan's new Cold War in Central America and urged students to, to try to help stop it. He wanted them to uh, make it like the Mississippi of, the gener of this generation rather than the Vietnam. The idea was to reach out in solidarity to the people of Central America as uh, student activists in the civil rights movement had done in Mississippi in, in the 60s. 
Ten years later, on the 30th anniversary of the free speech movement, Mario made an impassioned uh, speech here at Berkeley um, uh, on, from Spell Plaza, urging students to help resist uh, the anti-immigrant reaction uh, that had resulted in the passage of Proposition 187. So I just want to say that, you know, that, that all through his life, Mario had faith that, st that students could make a difference. And he actually died in the midst of a battle against the fee hike at Sonoma State. So this is something that, you know, that we're talking about, but, the, but I think that Mario actually uh, lived throughout his life. Now, um, not all student movements succeed. And you know, if you want to make change, it's not the easiest thing to do. And I wanted to reflect a bit about why the free speech movement uh, was successful at making change. Well, I think one of the best statements of this was made this past summer, uh, an interview I did with Jack Weinberg. Uh, asked why the free speech movement won, Jack's first response was, first of all, we were right. <laughs> the, the issue was, was a simple difference between the stated values and the actual practice of society. That by itself doesn't cause you to win, but it's hard to win a struggle if there's not a very strong case for your side. That was part of it. We were fighting in a very narrow issue. We didn't expand that demand. Today, often if you're engaged in a struggle, there's a big coalition, everybody has to put their demand in the hopper, and you have a big laundry list of demands, many of which are beyond what is possible at the time. We had a very simple set of demands and we stuck from day one to the very end. The FSM was about the untrammeled right to engage in political activity on campus as students, both the right to set up tables, but also the right to advocate a cause, the right to mobilize students for a political activity. Those are the issues that we stuck to. They fell completely within what American society was supposed to be about. And it was just a question of bringing that into alignment. That's number one. Number two, the FSM tried continually to broaden the base of support within the student body and secondarily within the faculty. So the idea of doing outreach, justifying the case, expanding itself, reaching out, so that by the end, we had overwhelming support among the student body and within the faculty. There was a certain respect for the FSM. Not everybody. The respect was strong, though. The legitimacy of the FSM demands was there, and we carried ourselves very well. A related strength, I think, was that the, uh, this nonviolent movement had an almost Gandhian faith that it, it could persuade its, its critics, and so eagerly engage them in serious dialogue, uh, convinced that evidence and reason and an honest reflection on history could enable even ardent critics to see the justifications for the movement's free speech goals and tactics. Perhaps the most striking example of this uh, came the, night of the, the first night of the police car uh, blockade, when, uh, when a hostile crowd and maybe a somewhat inebriated crowd of, of fraternity guys and athletes uh, uh, was uh, threatening violence against the, uh, the, the blockade and uh, uh, throwing uh, lit cigarettes and other uh, missiles at, at Mario and the others around the car. As the hecklers began throwing things, Savio you know, is to try to engage them in a discussion of civil disobedience which you know, you know, might even be something you think about doing in a seminar. You wouldn't often think you could do that when people are throwing things at you, okay? But this, is, this actually was what occurred. As the hecklers began throwing things, Savio urged that those who are part of the demonstration for freedom of speech on this campus remain calm. He sought repeatedly to explain the protest, but was interrupted by heckling. When he asked what they wanted, some replied, the car, let the policemen have their automobile, give up the car, yes or no. Savio replied, it's not, that, not as simple as that. And he urged that they think a little more deeply about the principles at stake in this free speech struggle. The hecklers responded by telling Savio, get off the car and show us your ID, your reg card, and quipped that if he didn't like Cal, he should go someplace else. Savio replied, look, the only reason that I took part in this is that I like Cal very much. I'd like to see it better. I'm not here to destroy something. We're here to build something. As the heckling continued, Savio managed to get the floor long enough to explain the meaning of civil disobedience and link the police and car blockade to the history of such dissent and dating back to Thoreau. And here's, here's a bit of that speech. I would like to explain, please, would the people here at least keep quiet? I would like to explain the principle, as I said before, and see if you're willing to accept it on the basis of which we took our action. Are you willing to listen? Hecklers are shouting, get off the car. 
have you ever heard of a man named Henry of, of Thoreau? The hecklers are still jeering. He says, the man's name was Henry David Thoreau. Part of his was life was during the United States, when the United States was engaged in the war with Mexico. At that time, there was no slavery in Mexico, and there was in the United States. This man believed that he could not in good conscience support a war to extend slavery into Mexico. And so you know what he did? He disobeyed the law. He refused to pay any taxes. He believed there were certain matters of conscience which exceed any legal matters in importance. We likewise, in this instance, believe that there are matters of conscience which greatly exceed the question of disobedience to law. Do you recognize that there are at least circumstances, and then the Hitlers interrupt and say, um, uh, we want the row, we want the row, we want the row, and then Mari replies, I wish I could give him to you. <laughs> That's a start. We'll be on the, you'll be on our side in a little while if you keep, if you keep that up. And uh, what I'm asking is this, he, he concluded, if you would just keep quiet and think for a moment on the principle, do you agree that there are times when questions of conscience exceed in important questions of law? That's the question. So I think that was part of the spirit of the FSM, being willing to engage your foes, even in this kind of, you know, really almost unbelievable uh, circumstances um, of opposition. The other part that, uh, of the, uh, what made the FSM effective was being both militant and confrontational, but still trying to keep things broad. That is, don't get ahead of your base. Even if you have militant tactics, try to explain it in terms that others will, can understand. And, and don't, go, don't move ahead of, of where the rest of the campus is. Don't move prematurely. So the, eventually, the FSM had the overwhelming support from the student body and uh, ultimately the faculty on December 8th and the TAs who supported the, uh, the FSM with a, with, a, with a strike after the mass arrest. So in addition to all these things, in addition to being right, I think, on the free speech issue, I don't think anyone's gonna challenge that at this point, the FSM was also helped by the crude way in which the administration could be wrong, its heavy handedness. Um, and, and in fact, there was within the free speech movement something called the atrocity theory. That is, uh, I think Art Goldberg may have originated the term, that if, things, if the movement is flagging and you don't think that you, things are going well, don't despair, just wait, the administration will do something else very heavy-handed heavy, heavy and stupid. And, and, you know, I think any historian who studied the free speech movement will see the truth of it. You know, I don't have a top 10 list of mis stupid mistakes that the administration made, but at least the top three. One would be, you know, arresting Jack Weinberg in broad daylight at about noon when thousands of students are getting out of classes to go to lunch and bring a police car so everybody can see this happening. And Mario's response, he said, you know, he just said, kerplunk, they put this police car down there. You'd have to be bereft of all sense to do that. And so that helped, that was, that was a tremendous uh, spark right there. Um, a, second, a second thing I would point to is, um, is the, uh, when the movement was sort of a losing steam right before the Thanksgiving holidays during what was called the aborted sit-in, which was a sit-in in response to what the regents had done or, uh, or not done on free speech. And the sit-in really, didn't, really didn't really draw many people. Uh, the movement seemed in crisis. And so what does the administration do over the Thanksgiving break? It sends out disciplinary letters to Mario and other leaders of the FSM for things they already were supposed to have been, you know, really discussed and settled by the faculty committee that dealt with it. So it seemed as if the administration was really kind of um, being vindictive. And, uh, uh, and so, what, what, in fact, the free speech movement, movement was often at its most effective when it combined the free speech issue with this feeling of the need for solidarity to protect people in the movement from unfair be, uh, unfairly being singled out. So that would be the second. The third one would be this one. This is the Greek theater. Now, this is an amazing moment. Uh, and actually, Dorothy Lang, the great documentary photographer, said that you can throw out all the thousands of words about this controversy. This picture explains the whole thing, this one picture. And what happened here was the administration and the department chairs were trying to, to come up with a settlement, which was you know, not viable anyway. But they were going to have this meeting. They had this meeting at the Greek theater. And I guess this was like their, their answer to a strike. They canceled classes. And they were going to, the department chair, and the, uh, the administration were going to impose the settlement. But they wouldn't let any students speak at the meeting. You know, not only Mario, but even Charlie Powell, the student government president, who was really you know, very moderate and not even, you know, not even pro FSM on, on, on in tactical issues, um, they wouldn't let anybody speak. And just think about it. You had this semester full of free speech controversy involving student rights. The students have, um, have gotten, you know, they did this mass protest. Hundreds of them were arrested, and they're sitting in the audience, 
And you really think you're going to have a meeting to discuss a settlement without letting any of them speak? So, I mean, this is the kind of, you know, not a very smart, uh, smart move. And so um, uh, Mario, at the end of the meeting, walked up to the podium. And as you can see, the police grabbed him and dragged him away in, before he could say a word in front of like 15,000 students and faculty, m most of whom were really outraged, because this really showed, you know, one of the leaders of the free speech movement being, you know, basically gagged in front of their eyes. And Mario said that, you know, that at that meeting, uh, Kerr and Scott Lapino were trying to snow people that there was a settlement, but uh, the velvet glove came off and you saw the mailed fist. After that, their, their goose was, was cooked, meaning that the next day, the Academic Senate voted in its, in its uh, December 8th resolutions to support the, uh, the free speech demands of the free speech movement. So I think that's another part of how this, what made this work was the fact that the administration was, was really, I think Jack's words that it's, uh, it was, its, behavior, it's, it's, its behavior was both predictable and stupid. And this, although I don't know if this could even be called predictable, it was definitely stupid. So, so the movement prevailed, and then in terms of its impact, you know, how did the FSM really change things? And I would say, first of all, obviously free speech on campus cannot be, um, cannot be, uh, the content of speech can no longer be restricted by the administration, by the university. That's, that's one, one piece of this. A second part would have been that I think it ended uh, the, um, um, uh, the uh, what you, it was the last act of, the, of the, uh, the McCarthy Cold War loyalty oath era. That back in the late 40s and early 50s, Cal had had the, the sort of the biggest purge of progressive faculty in the nation because of the loyalty oath controversy and now it had the greatest free speech victory in the country on campus. And so I think that helped to put an end. It was like the end of an era and the beginning of a new era here at Berkeley and also nationally. That I think that it created the political space that made possible an on-campus anti-war movement. Often in the past during, during uh, times of war, anti-war dissent is repressed. That would be very hard to do uh, after the free speech movement. It turned out not to be possible. Um, another impact would have been that it empowered students. It showed that they could use civil disobedience as a kind of great equalizer to give them leverage to, uh, to be counted, to, to, to have their perspectives counted in university decision making in a way it hadn't been before. So, uh, so I think those are all uh, impacts that the free speech movement had. Also in terms of education, it, um, oh, and by the way, that impact was very upsetting to people on the right who felt like this was unleashing a wave of anarchy on campuses across the country. And in fact, the President's Commission on Campus Unrest in 1970 um, talked about disruptive protest tactics as the Berkeley invention. And this, this was how they were invented. So, um, and also even had a global impact that um, there's a, 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 a historian named Jeremy Surrey who thinks that the global impact of this kind of protest all across Europe uh, uh, actually kind of uh, uh, stamped down support for any Cold War policies and pushed the leaders of these different regimes to support detente. And the CIA, in fact, did a report on student protests called Restless Youth, where they were fearful of this spreading wave of student protest across the country and across the world. In education, the last, the last impact I want to talk about is the impact on education that I think the free speech movement really got a lot of people to start questioning the uh, impersonality of the mass university and began to think about maybe students, just like they should be able to have a voice in political matters, they should be heard in academic matters as well. And so you got student-initiated courses and you got a lot of faculty concern with having more intimate connection with undergraduates. Um, that was supported, like Mario supported a kind of a great books program, the Tussman Plan. There was um, uh, Charles Muscatine uh, uh, was involved in something called the Strawberry Creek College, the Collegiate Seminar Program. And for Muscatine, it launched a, a lifetime of attempt to, to do work on undergraduate curriculum reform. Even into his 80s, he was republishing books on that. His last book was called, it was called Fixing College Education. It was a critique of mediocre undergraduate curricula. So um, those are all impacts. The last impact that I have to say is the FSM is either blamed or credited, depending on your politics, for the rise of Ronald Reagan. That is, there was a backlash against the free speech movement, and Reagan, uh, when he ran for governor in 66, came into office in part uh, pledging to clean up the mess in Berkeley. 
Now, I think this is a bit overstated because, because um, there are a lot of resentments that, that Reagan tapped into, not just Berkeley. Welfare Queens, the Watts Ghetto Rebellion, the Fair Housing Act, um, taxes. It, this, if you look at his opening speeches before he really discovered this issue, it wasn't even on his wavelength. He just caught, a, caught onto it as the as campaign began. So I'm not saying it's unimportant, but if you think that Berkeley alone elected Ronald Reagan, that's a simplification. But it is true that in that sense, the new left owns some, uh, owes something to the free speech movement, and so does the new right. Now, since this is the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement, I know that um, we uh, are focusing on the FSM, but I also want to be sure in the little time I have left to remind us that the free speech movement did not occur in a vacuum and that its, its roots are really deeply embedded in the civil rights movement, the black freedom movement. That Mario, uh, as a sort of a case study, but, but a lot of people in the movement uh, first came political aware because of the civil rights movement. And so, the 60s student activism, some people will be saying this week that it began here. It didn't. It began there. That is, Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960, the sit-in, this is from a historically black college in, uh, uh, in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, trying to, 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 uh, pro, to get rid of segregation in the downtown lunch counters. And this, even though Mario wasn't here, he was touched by this. Because in his neighborhood in Queens, there were sympathy demonstrations. And by the way, this spread from Greensboro all across the South and all across the country. So by the end of the year, there were between 50 and 75,000 people who'd been involved in these protests. And Mario, in his neighborhood in Queens, he, he saw a, a protest in front of the local Woolworths. And here's what he said. Even though, even though the protest was nonviolent and, in Mario's words, absolutely respectful and decorous, the protesters picketing the store were, in Savio's words, behaving differently than the conformist norms of the world he, in which he had grown up in the 1950s. And here's Mario saying, you see, people in those days obeyed the rules, all the rules. There were, they were, there were written down rules, and there were a whole bunch of rules that weren't written down. How you were supposed to dress, everything was so rigid. There was an internally opposed regimentation. So just the idea of people walking around in a little oval in front of Woolworths was massively nonconformist for that time. Something's going on here. That has to be seen against the background of absolutely nothing day to day going on in 1950s America. So it was attractive because it was real. I'd never seen anything like it before. Birmingham, the next huge event that really influenced Mario and lots of, uh, of, of students uh, and of his generation was the Birmingham protest. And um, that protest, uh, is often connected, obviously, with Martin Luther King. It was a great victory that paved the way for the March on Washington. But sticking with this theme of can students change the world, even very young students were involved in this protest. The black community of Birmingham was divided. King and his uh, aides in the ACLC were having a hard time mobilizing people, and they decided to go recruit in the schools. And they got a huge and overwhelming support. High school students, middle school students, even elementary students. And in fact, it caused this debate among the SCLC about you know, how, can you, how young can you go before it's sort of exploiting youth. Um, and so the first day, 600 kids were arrested. The next day, 1,000. And by the end of these protests, some 10,000 students were arrested. And these images had an enormous impact on the country, particularly on, on students, uh, because it demonstrated, it really brought to the surface this vicious racism that you could see it on the screen and being directed at nonviolent young people. And here is Mario's reaction to these, these scenes. He says, the civil rights movement just burst on the United States right on the tube. We saw people afraid of things more frightening than any I'd had to face. They faced their fears. They held one another to face their fears. And that moved many of us in white America who had the privileges of at least a cultural middle class after all, you know, I'm white ethnic working class. I'm mostly Sicilian, actually. But we all felt somehow we were part of the middle class. And I remember my parents saying things like, you know, you don't know how lucky you are. You haven't even had to work for it. And I don't say that to put them down. They did sometimes say that because they'd had to struggle. And so I saw people on the tube, and they had none of the privileges that I had and more to fear. They overcame their fear by holding one another against the snarling and snapping dogs, we swore against the torrents of water from the fire hoses, and they held one another. And that got to the children of white America. And we threw ourselves ardently into their movement. We wanted to be part of them. So 
this had a catalytic impact on many students. And I think in the, in the aftermath of Birmingham, in the next six months, there were some 100,000 uh, 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 people involved in civil rights protests and 15,000 arrests. And Birmingham, I think what happened here with the Bay Area Civil Rights Movement is connected. It's the tail end of that wave of protest. And that's what drew Mario in. Uh, he was involved, his first civil rights arrest was at the Sheridan Palace Hotel. And there the, there the cause was, was protesting against racist hiring practices. And it was only one of many of the Bay Area protests against racist hiring practices, refusing to hire blacks in any but the most menial positions and in very low numbers. And it was while, it was while in jail for that protest that Mario learned about Freedom Summer and the great, the great crusade in Mississippi centered on voter registration that Mario participated in in the summer of 64. I, I don't have time to go into detail about that, but that was a, a very, very important part of Mario's political evolution and had a great impact nationally. In the, in the South, he'd been, in Mississippi, he'd been threatened by night riders, attacked by Klansmen, mistreated by racist police. He'd gone door to door in rural areas asking African Americans to register to vote. And this was a kind of life and death thing that to go downtown to a segregated courthouse to register to vote was very risky. And, and the, these African-American farmers knew that. And Mario talked about, he remembered going to these, these farmhouses. The head of the household would come and say, look, I can't do this. If I go down there, I'm going to lose my job. Or I'm going to lose my land. Or someone might try to beat me up. And then Mario would say, um, uh, have you ever voted? And of course, because he'd been disenfranchised, the farmer said, no. He said, uh, did your father vote? No. Did his father vote? No. Do you want your children to vote? And then there'd be a silence, and sometimes that would, and what Mario said, by the way, that was such a nervy thing to say. Nobody told me to say it, but I did. And then afterwards, there would be uh, a willingness to, on, on the part of some of these, these farmers to come down and take the risk of registering to vote. So all of these things contributed to Mario's uh, evolution and to his generation's evolution and, and made possible the free speech movement. But the point being, when you act politically, as these student activists pol acted politically, didn't only change the things that they were, t they were seeking to change. That is, when the students sat in at Greensboro, they weren't thinking about what impact it was gonna have Mar on Mario Savio in New York City, right? And when these students sat in in, uh, in Birmingham, they weren't thinking about how that would see the, the, the Bay Area Civil Rights Movement help to energize things. But it, it, did, it, it did have that impact. So if you think about it, the sit-in movement in 1960, Birmingham, 63, the, uh, the Bay Area Civil Rights Movement in the spring of 60, and summer of 64, and Freedom Summer all contributed. Four movements contributed to the, the rise of the free speech movement. But that's not the end of it. There's a fifth movement. And that is, uh, actually was a little bit earlier, if I can get to it. That's the uh, anti-HUAC protests at City Hall. How did Mario Savio end up at Berkeley? You know, these days, because of the change attitude towards the FSM, there's something called branding. You know, that we have the FSM Cafe now, so now when we recruit students, we can say, Berkeley has a tradition of activism and social concern, so that's one of the attractions of Berkeley. Well, in, in 1960, in the early 60s, when Mario was thinking about where to go to college, um, and, uh, and, and when his parents moved out to California, uh, there was, no, there was no, no FSM Cafe, obviously, yet. So what, what got him out here? Well, it was an account of Slate's activism and these protests, uh, a book called Student, by a person who um, you may have heard of because he's so conservative today, David Horowitz. Mario had read that book in a drugstore in New York City and felt like Berkeley was an interesting place. And so, so the, what, what ends up happening is when he has to, his parents move to California, he's got to decide between Berkeley and UCLA, he decides Berkeley will be an interesting place. Okay, I want to conclude by saying, what about today? What's the FSM legacy today? I think Berkeley students and faculty are better qualified to say that, uh, to, to talk about that than I am, but I do think that the fact that there is this uh, legacy of activism, the fact that there is this legacy of free speech, the December 8th resolution still exists, and I know that a few years ago during Occupy, uh, with the, uh, um, the baton charge and the dispersal by, by force, of the, of the people on Sproul, that was a violation of December 8th. But the faculty uh, censured the administration for doing that. So I think there's an ongoing, um, you know, that tradition is still alive. 
Sometimes the students uh, uh, might violate the spirit of it uh, because there is a part of the December 8th resolution to talk about not disrupting the regular uh, functioning of the university, the time, place, and manner regulations. The FSM wanted free speech, but they knew that you couldn't have, have uh, a free speech in a classroom where you, you can't have demonstrations when you're trying to teach. So there, there is a time, place, and manner piece to it. But I think that tradition is very much alive. Along with free speech, the last thing I want to say, the, the thing I see even in the month that I've been here, the, sh the real element of continuity is in the sort of hyper-democratic mindset of student activists in both eras. That just a few days ago, there was an attempt to get the uh, regents to uh, divest uh, from companies that were involved with fossil fuels. Didn't succeed, but I think that the spirit of that, and maybe also probably the spirit of democratic education at Cal, DECAL, student-initiated courses, I hear in that kind of echoes of the free speech movement. The idea that students, you may not have an advanced degree yet, but you can read, you can think, you can act, and you can, you can, you should have, your voice should be heard. And I think there's an assumption there that the students know at least as much as the regents, and maybe more, and probably more. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, okay, there's a, there's, there's a perspective on it. But the point is that, um, that the, uh, the regents, um, the regents are, are being uh, challenged by students continually, and students feel as if they know enough about these issues that they should have a role. It's like, it's, the, uh, the, the, the phrase is participatory democracy. We shouldn't just be consumers here. We should be a part of this, uh, of, of the governance of our institution. And I want to just close with a quote that kind of embodies this, what I think is the spirit of the free speech movement, the anti-war movement, and these attempts to change university policy on the part of students. The idea that you don't have to be uh, in power, and you don't have to have finished your advanced degrees yet to have an impact on policy. This was a speech that Bob Moses, who Mario adored, he was the leader of Freedom Summer, um, Bob Moses of SNCC. This is a speech that he made here in, in 1965 during the, anti -war, the first anti-war teach-in in May of 65. And he was trying to get people to be more willing to challenge American foreign policy in the war in Vietnam by you know, basically saying you, you should be starting to think about how you can change people, uh, you can change policy. You don't have to be the leading foreign policy expert to be part of this dialogue. So here's what he did. He said, he, 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 he really explained this through a story. And it was a story of Mrs. Hazel Palmer. Uh, Mrs. Palmer uh, was a member of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party which is trying to challenge the white supremacist party, the Democratic Party of, Cal of, 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 uh, of Mississippi. And Mrs. Palmer, Moses explained, was working for $10, $15 a week as a maid most of her life. She stopped and changed last summer. And if you want to write her, and I suggest you do, a lot of you, drop her a line. Her name is Mrs. Hazel Palmer. You can write her at 507 and a half North Parish Street in Jackson, Mississippi, care of the Freedom Democratic Party. Ask her, what did you used to do? What do you do now? How come you changed? What gave you the courage to do that? What makes you think that instead of being a cook in somebody's kitchen, you could help run a political party? Where did you go to learn to do that? Did you go to school? Where did you go to learn how to do that? Because she's trying to help run Mississippi now. A lot of people out here are gonna to have to try and help run this country. And to do it, you're gonna to have to think differently about yourselves and begin to think a little like Mrs. Palmer thinks about herself. And you're going to have to find out how you can make that switch. Thanks. going to have a reception afterwards um, but we have in some a few minutes, uh, but there is, I think, some time for some questions, comments. Hello. Uh, maybe some of the FSM vets would like to add something to what Robbie has to say. Any questions or comments from the audience? We uh, and we have some mics. We're going to take questions from students first. Um, that one up there. Are you a student? Undergraduate students first? Are you an undergraduate student? Do any undergraduate students have a question? Here's one. 
Do we have any under undergraduate students who have a question? I guess he's it. Um, well, let's start with that young man up here. Yeah. He spoke what at I, our last event. <clears throat> what I've noticed happening over the past uh, maybe 15 or 20 years in the Bay Area is that there actually has been an erosion, uh, somewhat of an erosion of free speech on the left by leftists who ask critical questions of especially icons, major and minor, on the left. Uh, to be brief, you know, this erosion has primarily taken, uh, has occurred by the use of index cards. And the only real purpose for index cards is to censor questions, either by watering them down or by sifting out the ones that the moderator doesn't like that may, that may challenge uh, a major or minor icon. And I think this is something that students should be aware of this practice, and this practice should cease. Um, but even at a Mario Savio Memorial Award lecture, where warmonger Christopher Hitchens was the guest, Lynn Hollander Savio would not even per permit the young student awardees to criticize Hitchens' pro-war mongering policy. You can see this on YouTube if you just put in Christopher Hitchens and uh, Mario Savio Memorial Lecture. It's on YouTube. Uh, the other quick point is, you know, there should, there's this talk now, of course, on campus, which we're all aware of, that there shouldn't be tension in protests, and no one should be made uncomfortable for protests. And what I want to say is that there shouldn't be violence, but there should be, if anti-oppression activists are doing their job, uncomfortableness and tension. And there, must, there should not be violence, but there must be uncomfortableness and tension when power and oppression are challenged. The suffragettes movement created uncomfortableness and tension. The civil rights movement, the feminist and womanist movement, the anti-Vietnam War and anti-Iraq War movement, the anti-apartheid movement, the gay movement, and today the movement against racist political Zionism and the, against the oppression of in the oppression of the indigenous Palestinian people, and now the new suppression of academic free speech at the behest of the Israel lobby and Zionist on campus. So I want to say tension and uncomfortableness should not be avoided when you're challenging power. And I'm sure if Mario Savio were here today, he would be the first to agree with that. Maybe Robbie wants yeah, to I, I'll something. respond to that. I, I don't think uh, anyone suggested that Mario was afraid of tension or any of the things that you're talking about. Well, I was just saying that I also think that he was speaking about responsibility and before people speak to think about what impact it has on the community. That's not prescriptive, not saying, you know, I have some regulation or that I don't want you to be upset. It's just saying that before you speak, you should consider, you know, what you're saying and what impact it's having and whether it's going to promote uh, the ideas and, 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 and whether it's going to promote a dialogue with your listeners. I um, so, so, so I was just agreeing with anything. You said. No, no, I'm, I'm just saying, no, but I'm, you raised the issue. I just wanted to explain. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think it's, a, it's an important point. That's okay. all. I wasn't taking issue with you. I'm just okay. saying okay. that I think that, um, that these things are not, to my mind, and I don't think in Mario's mind, they're in conflict. There's a reason why he talked about freedom and responsibility together, because he wasn't talking about repression, he was talking about thinking. You should think about what you're going to say before you say it. And, and by the way, I think, in part because he used to have a terrible speech defect, I think that, and, and saw free speech as this divine gift almost, that he wanted us to really be thoughtful about what we say. And so, and also be very thoughtful about what we hear. So I think that, you know, in this discussion that we had on campus about civility and the way it's gotten, or, you know, all bent out of shape, um, I think, you know, I don't want to go there, but I do want us to, to, to say that I think discussing the nature of our political discourse is worth doing. It doesn't mean you're being repressive. It just means you're trying to be thoughtful. And I think that's how I see what Mario was doing. He wasn't saying, don't say this. He was saying, think first. Because you want to have an audience that thinks as well. We have speech for a reason. And hopefully, you know, in his idea of the university, it was to promote thought and critical, critical, uh, critical mindedness. Um, we have a question over here. 
All right, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about something that, that um, I was thinking about as this was going on, because the free speech movement was also a venue where older American radicals, like, uh, or not American radicals, but people like Isaac Deutscher and uh, Hal Draper had a big impact on people. And, um, you know, for the more serious activists who went through, through the experience of the free speech movement, they came to realize that students can change the world, but not alone. They have to connect to other sections of the population. And I know many people became part of that radicalizing revolutionary movement of American youth and moved to places like Detroit to try to do a more serious work. So if you could speak to that in your research, that would be oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. I want to say, firstly, um, just to be clear, I, you know, I went on too long anyway, but the, uh, there wasn't time to talk about there's very rarely a free sp um, in any student movement that's not connected to community activism. That is, this Bay Area uh, civil rights movement that led directly to the free speech movement in many ways was a coalition between students and community organizers. There is almost always a connection between adults and student activists, whether it's a, a professor, whether it's community organizers, the kind of radical intellectuals you're talking about. Uh, there's, students don't, ex don't exist in a vacuum. And um, so I think that's a very important part. And if actually, if you look at the, um, the letters, one of the great, I think, one of my favorite documents of the uh, set of documents on the free speech movement is the letters that uh, the arrestees wrote to Judge Crittenden just before they were going to be sentenced. And the judge had one of the students, I wrote an, uh, a chapter about this in the book that Reggie Zelnick and I edited. The, the judge had hoped the students would be apologetic about sitting in. And they weren't, which is why they were never entered into the court record and got lost for years and years. But if you look at those letters, they cite all kinds of political figures, from Gandhi to Martin Luther King. Many, many uh, adult thinkers had influence on people. So I don't think there's, any, there's very rarely such a thing as a student movement that's not intimately tied up with a kind of radical tradition or some kind of activist tradition that's, that's community-based. So these coalitions are very, very important. I think that's a, a really important point that you're raising. I think we have a question. Oh, right. And we have one right here, too. Okay. So we have to keep our questions brief because we only have about 10 more minutes. A very brief comment and a question. Um, I understand that uh, Harry Bridges did not support um, the free speech movement. And I wanted to know if you knew anything about that. I never heard. Did you um, hear that, Chuck? No. And that's been cited by people, uh, I believe, uh, of a Trotsky's persuasion, but uh, it's related to the split. It was put in, in two pieces. The, the 1946 general strike in Oakland, which the AFL had, and he didn't support it because he was in the CIO. Uh, and, then they, and then they said as an afterthought, and he also didn't support uh, or endorse uh, the free speech movement. So I just want to know. I haven't heard that generally. The labor movement was very supportive of the free speech movement. Right. Uh, anyway, the California, I, yeah, the, so the California like the teachers, the Teamsters. Uh, there was a, a, a really a great deal of support. Uh, not all the unions did. I remember in Mario's famous speech when they're going to Sproul, he was complaining that he couldn't get a hold of the painters' union, but don't disrupt the painters in the in the building. So, but uh, generally, the labor movement was supportive. Go ahead, Lerner. Right, right. And, uh, our strategies. So, but they were basically Jack, you want to say something? Supportive. And Mario was given a job by the ILWU at, right after the protest, so I don't think that was public. Okay, well, I'm going to check yeah. that out. I appreciate that. Yeah. Anyway, just and one other piece. Um, there is not a strike yet, but there is increasingly a movement towards within the bus driver's union, ATU 192, AC Transit, about the right to go to the bathroom. And it's a real serious issue, and I, I hope that people will keep their eyes open and there'll be petitions and things to support those workers. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Okay, it seems to me that we've mastered uh, freedom of speech. And, uh, I practice it all the time, and that it seems to me that the next problem is getting people to actually listen. And uh, the, the latest trend from, from my observation is uh, 
I make my freedom of speech, you know, to public officials or, or whoever, I don't. I get no response. So what? What, <laughs> what do you think the next? Well, you have is. to organize. That is, if enough people uh, um, uh, will articulate something, people will have to respond. That's, that's the nature of political organizing. I mean, if, if the free speech movement had had just like 10 people uh, asking uh, Chancellor Strong to uh, get rid of the free speech ban, we would never have gotten rid of it. It had to become a mass movement. So I think you, uh, that, that being able to have influence is about power. And in the case of students, power comes from numbers, and numbers come from organizing, and organizing comes from talking to people. So I think it's a it's a it's a it's a process. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I don't think he needs a mic. Because some movements later seem to have forgotten it. We had a passion for what we were fighting for and the ideas, and we believed we were right. Yeah. But we listened very carefully to those who did not agree with us. We had Charlie Powell, the head of the ASUC, who was completely opposed to us, to speak at our microphone to our rallies twice from the top of the police car and to speak opposing our mass sit-in in December. We gave him the microphone so the other side could be heard because we had a fundamental respect for the ability of those we were trying to reach to make up their minds not by the ferociousness of our rhetoric and our righteousness, but because of our reasoned arguments were better than those opposing us. And we listened when the students told us, no, you got the bit in your teeth, you're going too fast, we're not with you yet, take it a little easier. And we listened to that, and we judged our tactics and our strategy to bring people with us not to be so impressed with our own self-righteousness that we would go off and take down the university by our sheer macho and our sheer self-righteousness. We hit them with the entire student body and won the faculty to our side because we respected them enough to present our arguments in such a way they could hear them, absorb them, and agree with them in the end and move to action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pro <laughs> Professor Cohen, we have a question way up there. Oh, hi. Uh, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. I also like the part where you made the important emphasis on how a lot of the stuff that happened here in Berkeley had to do with people looking at the oppression of black people. And the images that you showed of um, the dogs attacking black people, it made me think of what's happening in Ferguson, Missouri. Mm -hmm and how the oppression of black people is still very alive and very present. Um, and then there's also this um, month of resistance happening in October that's been initiated, initiated by Cornell West, people like Alice Walker, Carl Dix, and I was just wondering what you thought about that and the need for students here to have to play a role in that. Oh, I think it's very important for, I mean, I think, one of the things about this movement I didn't get to talk about was at the time, the student body was so overwhelmingly white that you know, this was, for many students, the involvement in the freedom movement, black freedom movement, was the only integrated experience they had. You know, so it was an important part of, of Mario's education and many student activists' education. And that's not the only reason to do it. There's an issue of social justice itself. That's, that's at the top of the list. But I'm saying it's, it's extremely important for students to not become cl cloistered and you know, to just watch these things on TV. So I think there's a strong tradition, uh, and that's why, by the, the reason why I'm emphasizing this in, in, in talking about the free speech movement, there's a tendency to say, okay, Freedom Summer's anniversary was over there in the summer, and the FSM's over here. They're really all so connected. And I think any progressive movement needs to be connected to the issues that you're talking about. And in fact, if you look at the statements of James Farmer and John Lewis, and Bayard Rustin uh, and James Baldwin regarding the free speech movement, they didn't make a distinction between the free speech movement and the civil rights movement. They thought it was all the same thing. And I think a, a movement that's concerned about social justice that doesn't pay attention to race is you know, not serious. So I think it's, I, I think, I take your point, I think it's very important. Thanks. We have the last 
Yeah, I think, I think we should end it now, but Lynn Holland de Savio wants to make a couple of announcements before we close. Uh, just uh, to let you know, if you haven't discovered it already, Saturday, this coming Saturday, the uh, Free Speech Movement reunion will be having panels up at Bolt Hall all day. The first panel, which is a, it's actually the plenary session, will have uh, Ben Jealous, formerly head of the NAACP, and Martha Noonan, who is a Freedom Summer volunteer and community organizer and educator. They'll be speaking <clears throat> with Bettina Aptecker about um, both the voting rights suppression that has been going on and also police brutality and um, the uh, criminal justice system. Um, uh, uh, you know, the put down of the black community with, through police brutality in the criminal justice system. So that will be from 10.30 to noon in uh, Booth Auditorium. And then in the afternoon from 1.30 to 3, 15, uh, 3 o'clock and then 3.15 to 4.45. There will be panels on uh, free speech and academic freedom. There will be um, a panel on building a movement against economic inequality and several other issues. And I urge you to go on the Free Speech Movement Archives website, just Google Free Speech Movement Archives, and you'll find the whole thing. And then on Sunday, I hope you'll all turn out in the afternoon or the evening, and also Saturday night, there's some seats available still, for the musical of the FSM, which is a, a really exciting and fun uh, show, which is pretty historically accurate and um, has delightful uh, songs and um, really, brings, <laughs> really brings the issues alive. And um, one of the two composer lyricists, one of them is Bruce Barthol, who was one of the youngest people in the FSM and would have gotten arrested unless, until, except for the fact that he was sent home because he was a juvenile. And um, secondly, um, had, had the uh, other composer lyricist is Daniel Savio, Mario, and my son. So come Saturday night or Sunday afternoon or evening. It's at Berkeley Rep, the thrust stage, and it's very, very good. Sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that note, let's end. Let's thank Robbie again, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>